And welcome, it's Monday, one o'clock, time for the Deal Doctor live stream. And I'm glad you all joined, whoever is out there. Um, today, we're going to dig down a little bit deeper uh, into the issue of dual agency and try to clarify uh, where the lines are drawn and the process for going into dual agency. There's still a lot of confusion about that, and so um, we're going to try to clarify it for you. Okay, so first of all, I'll talk about five-star company policy. Five-star company policy is that if it's at all possible for you to avoid dual agency, avoid it. There are going to be some circumstances where you cannot avoid attempting to go into dual agency. Um, if you own the property, you can never go into dual agency. No judge in the world is going to believe that you represented a buyer and yourself equally in a dual agency situation. If you have a relationship with someone, uh, an old college roommate, a uh, next door neighbor, a friend, relative, uh, whatever that relationship might be, if it is a long-standing relationship, it's going to increase exponentially the risks of you going into dual agency. For example, if I have my uncle's house listed, and I've known my uncle for, for, for decades, obviously, um, and somebody walks into the open house that I've never met, and they say, well, we want you to write an offer for us. I say, that's fine, I'd love to, be happy to. I need to ex disclose to you that I have a contract with the seller, I am working as a seller's agent, and as long as you're okay with me representing the seller in this transaction, then I'd be happy to write up an offer. Some agents are going to refer that buyer out, and that's entirely okay. Uh, if that's your policy, if that's what you feel is going to make you feel more comfortable about the situation, by all means, you have every right to do that. It's not required, however. Now. Um, as I said, if you have a relationship with the person whose home you have listed, uh, it's going to be very difficult if you're ever called upon to justify your dual agency, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to uh, get a judge to say, oh yeah, you represented both parties equally because the relationship existed before um, you listed the property and continues during that period of time that you listed the property. Um, now, as I said, I've had some situations where a buyer has walked into an open house, said, I want to buy the house directly from you, and um, I, you know, I'm not working with another agent, uh, and I want, to, I want to work directly with you. That's fine, as long as they understand that I'm working as a seller's agent. My personal uh, stance on this is I will not work as a dual agent, period. I just feel as though there's too much risk. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't do that. It means that um, for me, that's, that's risky business. Um, I may refer it out. I may even suggest that they get their own agent, but uh, it's not required that you do that. However, if you decide to go down that road, if you decide to become a dual agent, first of all, you cannot make the choice to be a dual agent on your own. You can't be the one to make the decision about being a dual agent. That permission to be a dual agent has to come from both the buyer and the seller. They have to agree, both of them, that you can be a dual agent. You can't simply fill out the forms and say, here, sign this, I'm going to be a dual agent. Okay? So, let's be very clear about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to bring in some friends uh, just to help uh, clarify this issue and maybe uh, provide some uh, 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 visual uh, uh, help here. And this, let's pretend that that's a seller. Okay? And let's pretend that that's a buyer. And, of course, the special five-star agent. She's got, she's got a star. <laughs> All right. Anyway, 
the very first thing that will likely happen, the very first document that is going to be signed is the West Michigan, for example, the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement or the listing contract in your area. Now, some areas, some multiple listing systems have um, a checkbox that says that a agent may find themselves uh, in a dual agency position and that, and that may happen. It doesn't, that's not permission to go into dual agency. It's simply disclosure that that situation may, you may face, be faced with that. But before you can go into it, you have to get the permission of both parties. But first, let's go back to the step. You list a house. You disclose who you're working for, the seller. It's real simple. Batman, the seller. Okay. Now you just so happen to be working with a buyer. Who's this guy? Flash? Is that Flash? I'm getting some help here, okay? So, Flash is the buyer. And see how easy it is? Sorry, Batman is a seller, that's a listing contract. Flash is a buyer, and he fills out a buyer's agency contract. Now, in addition to that, Flash fills out or signs a disclosure regarding agency relationship that says that you are working for him, Flash, as a buyer. So far, we've got four forms, right? a listing contract, buyer contract, and disclosure as a seller's agent and disclosure as a buyer's agent. Pretty easy so far. Then, Flash decides that he wants to buy Batman's property. Okay, what happens next? We have a wonderful five-star agent who has difficulty standing. Um, and the five-star agent has to do two things. First of all, she has to disclose to both parties the nature of her working relationship with the buyer and the seller. Flash, I have a buyer's agency contract with you, and I'm working for you as a buyer's agent. Batman, I have a listing contract, and I'm working for you as a seller's agent. But guess what? I also have Flash wants to buy Batman's house. Okay, guess what has to happen? Is this Wonder Woman? I think that's Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel? I think. Okay, I'm not sure. Whoever this is. Captain Marvel has to turn to Batman and Flash and say, may I be a dual agent? If that first, I would first of all say, is everybody okay with me acting as a seller's agent? And the buyer would then rescind the buyer's agency contract, at least as it regards this property. That's one option. Now, let's say, yeah, they're both okay with me acting as a dual agent. Then I get to have each of them sign a new disclosure Regarding agency relationship, I have to have them both sign and agree that I can go into dual agency. It's a new disclosure regarding agency relationship that says I'm now going to act as a dual agent. Does everybody agree? Is that okay? If either party says no, then you can't do that. You just can't go into dual agency. You may end up having to refer it out or say to one party or the other, I'm going to continue to act in one party's behalf, whichever it might be. So once they agree, once they say, okay, got it, we understand now, and they sign that, then you can give them the this, uh, dual agency agreement to sign. That is the actual contract that 
explains the limitations and responsibilities that an agent has as it regards the buyer and the seller in this situation. So, I don't know how many of you were counting, but that is seven forms. Seven forms. First, the first two forms being the uh, disclosure regarding agency relationship for buyer and for seller, that's two. A listing contract, buyer's agency contract. If you end up going into dual agency, then you have three more forms that need to be signed. A disclosure that you are now going to go into dual agency and both of them must sign it prior to you submitting an offer along with the uh, agency, dual agency agreement, the designated agency contract. So, seven forms in all if you go down the road of dual agency. And um, I apologize if I got the whole Captain Marvel thing wrong. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I think my, my, my granddaughter will like these. I think that that's, uh, she'll enjoy learning all about dual agency at the age of almost three, I'm sure. Um, or just playing with the toys. Okay, so, um, any questions? Do we have any questions on that? And what's our time like? 112. 112? Went through it that fast? Oh boy, okay. Um, there was a question that I wanted to address that came up last night uh, regarding escalation clauses and um, on Facebook Connect, and Paul Carlson gave exactly the right answer, which is that um, we do have language in our dot loop form under clauses for escalation clauses. And it's very specific that the language includes um, the phrase that uh, you're comparing apples to apples, removing the concessions from any offers to make them on the same level, a level playing field, and that you do not have to counter an offer or indicate what the offer price is on page six. That is an option, but recognize that it is a counter. You can counter an escalation clause uh, offer with the simple language that seller rejects the escalation clause and hereby counters at $265,000, for example. That's one option. Or you can accept it as written, provide the triggering escalation clause, and that is enough uh, as an enforceable contract. However, we would strongly recommend that you include um, the uh, escalation clause addendum, which is in dot loop, which explains that this addendum is simply to not a counter offer, but to simply clarify what the final price is. That is a really, really good addendum to use. Um, and rather than putting it in as a counter offer on page six of the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement or wherever it might show up on uh, the purchase agreement that you use, using that uh, escalation clause addendum um, can be really helpful to you. So, um, time we got? 114. 114. Okay, well, um, that's a lot of information in a short time, so I'm going to cut it off and make it, make it uh, a quick here today because it's going to be easier for you to go back and, and review it uh, if it's shorter. So again, thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next week.